Hey, what's up, guys? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com, coming to you from my extremely messy home office behind me. I apologize for that, and I got to put on my cheesy drugstore glasses so I could see. Um, so let's talk about exercise because we should. It's an important topic and it bears discussion. Uh, has anybody ever told you that regular exercise would be good for you? Not for the obvious reasons that we're all aware of, but because it would actually lower your overall anxiety level, uh, maybe make your panic attacks less frequent and easier to manage. Now, have you ever looked at that person after they said that? Like they were completely insane because for you, exercise has the exact opposite impact. Uh, it may cause elevated anxiety levels or even lead to full-blown panic. Well, if this is you, and, and it was me, that used to be a problem for me too. If this is you, uh, I can tell you that you are far from alone. It's an extremely common problem for people who are dealing with anxiety disorders, especially if there are two conditions present. Number one, if you're having panic attacks on a regular basis, actual panic attacks, then the odds become a little higher that you're struggling with exercise. Uh, number two, if you are in that mindset where you look at anxiety and panic attacks, especially as something you need to have a plan for because you need to try and avoid it. You need to try and stop panic from ever happening in the first place. And above all, if you feel that a panic attack is an event that you need to be rescued or saved from, whether you're doing it yourself or you're relying on other people to do it for you, if this is the way you view anxiety and panic, then there's a very good chance that exercise is more than just a struggle for you. It may actually actually be just something that you say that you cannot do. Now, this is a common problem, as I mentioned, but it's also a really solvable problem, and it's worth solving for a variety of reasons. Number one, if we don't exercise, we're certainly missing out on the potential positive benefits of exercise. There are health benefits, there are mental health benefits, and yes, even though it sounds like crazy talk, among those are a decreased overall anxiety level in your life. So if we don't exercise, we're going to miss out on those things. But more important, uh, I think there are two things that we have to look at here. If you don't exercise, there are real tangible negative psychological impacts that come along with that. Uh, they really revolve around adding yet another item to the long and possibly growing list of things that you can't do because of anxiety. This is not good for your self-image. It's not good for confidence. It's not good for your overall outlook. And it makes things feel like they're getting worse instead of better, which is something that we do not want. But I think more importantly along those lines... When everybody is telling you, your friends, your family, your doctors, the internet, everybody's telling you that exercise will make you feel better, but it actually makes you feel worse. I know when I was in that situation myself, I used to think to myself, well, everybody is telling me that this will make it better, but it actually makes me worse. So I must have the worst, most unique, never seen before, untreatable alien anxiety ever. And, you know, I'm joking a little bit about it, but it was a real issue for me and it used to weigh me down a lot. It was not a good thing to have in my head at all. So we really want to avoid these psychological negative impacts that come along with not exercising because of the way it makes you feel. But here is probably the most overlooked and probably the most important reason why this is a problem that's worth solving. When you can solve the exercise problem, when you can learn to exercise regularly, while being comfortable without going into freak out mode, then there the odds become very high that not only will you have solved that problem, but because exercise is an excellent form of what's called interoceptive exposure, you will have also sort of accidentally solved other problems too. So learning to exercise comfortably, learning to exercise without going into panic, can actually be a springboard for improving the entire rest of your life with regard to your anxiety situation. So because you learn to walk on the treadmill or because you learn to go to the gym or run on the track or walk your dog or, or whatever exercise you like to do, swimming, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you learn to do that and be comfortable doing that, then the odds become extremely high that you will also be much more comfortable tackling those other problem areas that you've been dreading. Maybe things like going to a movie or going to school or work or going to a shopping mall or a family function or being left home alone. These things that seem like insurmountable things for you to overcome at times can actually become much easier to deal with, much easier to fix once you have fixed the exercise problem. So most people don't realize this and it's at such a point 
in my opinion, that I think if your life is shrinking to the point where you have a very long list of things that you won't do anymore, that include just general life tasks like shopping or picking up your kids from school, and you're relying on your wife or your husband or your boyfriend to do that for you, and it's causing relationship problems, and you feel like things are just getting worse and worse and worse, I would almost advise you to forget the rest of it for now. Forget that and let's just work on learning how to exercise. Because if you can learn how to exercise, I'm not saying that exercise is a cure-all for every evil in the world. It's certainly not. But in our situation, if we can learn to exercise, you can very often start to overcome all those other obstacles in a much more rapid fashion than you otherwise would have imagined that you could do. All right, so this is why we want to start talking about this. And this is why we want to look at how to solve this problem. So I think I'm going to make this a two-part series. This will be a two-part podcast uh, episode, two-part video, whatever way you're consuming it. Uh, what we want to look at now is let's look at the mechanism that causes this problem. Because it might seem obvious, but there's a twist to it. And the twist is extremely important. So we need to go over that. So as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm actually sitting on a stool in my messy office. I'm looking into my, my Macintosh and I'm talking to you. So my body is not doing much work at all because I'm not asking it to. So my heart rate is pretty low, pretty close to my resting heart rate. I'm not breathing very heavily. I'm certainly not sweating. And if you were to measure my blood pressure, I'm sure that would be pretty low. And if you were to measure the muscle tone in my body since the chair is holding me up and I'm not doing a whole lot of work, that would be pretty low too. So since I am not putting any demands on my body right now, I'm at a pretty low energy state. And I think no one would be surprised at that. I might not be as low in energy state as if I was sleeping or laying on my sofa reading a book, but pretty low, pretty low nonetheless. Now let's assume that I uh, pick up the camera and I take it with me to the gym. And I walk it to the gym and I put 400 pounds on a barbell. I stick it on my shoulders and I start doing squats. So after the first set of, say, six or eight squats with 400 pounds on my back, and by the way, I'm not telling you that's what you have to do. Whatever works for you is fine. It doesn't matter what it is. But after that first set of serious exertion with 400 pounds across my back, uh, it's a short bet that I wouldn't look like this. Uh, my face would be red. I'd probably be sweating like crazy. My heart would be pounding, probably up over 100 beats per minute. Uh, I would be breathing very heavily, kind of gasping for air because that's what squats do for me. Uh, if I would, like I said, I would be sweating. I would be crazy hot. Uh, and I think if you were to measure my blood pressure, that certainly would be highly elevated. And if you were measuring things like muscle tone on my body, that would also be through the roof. Now, assume for a second that I have a team of world-class physicians surrounding me, and they have me hooked up to every possible modern medical monitoring device while I'm doing that. Well, I would lay dollars to donuts that none of those doctors would probably even bother to look up from their phones. They'd be watching Netflix or YouTube or texting or doing whatever it is they do because none of what they would be seeing on those instruments would be of note to them at all. All of it would be completely predictable, completely expected, totally within the bounds of normal, and certainly completely safe. Because the normal physiological response to exercise includes a rapid heart rate, heavy breathing, sweating, increased blood pressure. All of those things are supposed to happen when you ask your body to increase its energy output. Now, I think we all know that, but if you look at, let's take three of these things, because they're probably the three most important things. Let's take the racing heart, the heavy breathing, and the sweating. And think for a second, because it's only going to take you a second, what else involves a racing heart, heavy breathing, and sweating? And I think, like I said, you're going to know right away, a panic attack. So here's where most people say, well, this is the problem. When I exercise, it feels like a panic attack. And that is true, but that is not the whole problem. Here's where the twist is, and it's a really important twist, so hang in there with me. I'm going to use my own story as an, an illustration here of where the real problem actually lies. So back in the days when I lived my life completely consumed with anxiety and panic, and I was worried about the next attack, terrified of it, and wondering what would I would do to save myself or have my wife or my mother or whoever save me from that panic attack. When I was in that mode, and maybe you're in it now, uh, I was also about 100 pounds heavier. I was in terrible condition. So for a variety of reasons, my doctor and virtually everyone else in my life was all over me uh, to exercise regularly, and rightly so. So I broke down and brought a treadmill, threw it in my basement, and I would drag my rear end down to the basement, get on the treadmill, and all I could do in those days was walk at about two miles an hour. But that's fine because that was exercise for me then. The exercise itself and the intensity doesn't really matter, as you'll see. After walking on that treadmill at only two miles an hour for maybe a minute or two, naturally my heart rate would go up. Uh, then my breathing would start to increase as well because my heart is beating 
more quickly. I need more oxygen to my cells, so I need to take in more oxygen. So I breathe more heavily. Now, after another minute or two after that, <clears throat> my body is performing more work. It's increasing its energy output. That means I'm generating more heat. And since humans need to stay cool, our natural cooling mechanism is sweating. So I'd begin to sweat. My forehead would get all wet. I would start to sweat right here under my nose and on my chin. Uh, and I would begin to feel that I was, say, hot on my neck because I was generating heat. But yet I was cold and clammy up here, which is what's supposed to happen because when the perspiration evaporates, your skin gets cooler. That's exactly what the mechanism is. It's supposed to happen. But as soon as I would feel that change in temperature in my skin, as soon as the sweating kicked in, that's when things would really go off the rails for me. So because I was living my life completely consumed with how I felt and worried about that next panic attack and what I was going to do to stop it or save myself from it, my brain would interpret that no normal bodily function that came along with exercise as danger. So I go into fight or flight mode, the adrenaline dump would hit, and I would immediately go into that startled and braced, I'd be braced against the fear, and I would go into what I call oh my God mode. Oh my God mode means that probably 70% of the thoughts that roll through my head contain the phrase, oh my God, which we know is never good. Uh, and the other 30% were probably centered around the phrases, it feels like, or what if. So the negative thoughts would start to run through my head. I would begin to engage them in an inner dialogue. So I would, I would make them worse. Oh my God, what if, what if? And I would start to think about what could be wrong. Oh my God, what's going on here? I would be terrified. And within another minute or two, what started as a little two mile an hour gentle walk on my treadmill would be a full blown five alarm panic attack. And that included depersonalization, derealization, dizziness, stomach problems, wobbly legs, shaking, fear, dizziness, all of it would be there at the same time. And now I'm in a full panic. It's important to understand that things like depersonalization, derealization had nothing to do with walking on the treadmill. And here's where that twist comes in, because we need to break the link, right? We need to break, unlink exercise and panic. We need to break that link. So if we say, but I exercise, I end up panicking. Let's follow that through. When I get on my treadmill, the only thing that that actually caused, the only direct result of me walking on my treadmill in those days was that my heart rate would increase, I would breathe more heavily, I would sweat, and I guess my blood pressure would go up, muscle tone would increase. Those are the only things that I could directly attribute to the treadmill itself. So you would say, yeah, but you got in the treadmill and you panicked. If I exercise, I have a panic attack. But the only thing that was directly caused by the act of walking on the treadmill were those normal changes in state in my body. Increased heart rate, increased breathing, sweating, higher blood pressure, more muscle tone, and so forth and so on. So if we're going to unlink the exercise and the panic, we have to break the chain right there and draw a line. Because if, if we break that link and it wasn't the treadmill that caused the panic, then where did the panic come from? Well, I think you kind of get where I'm going from at this point. The panic came from here. So what wound up happening is since I viewed my panic attacks and anxiety as dangerous things that I needed to be saved from because I feared them so much, I knew they weren't actually dangerous. I, I totally knew that. I, I, I completely understood that. But since I feared them, I felt that I needed to be rescued from the fear since those were dangerous things to me, my brain would incorrectly interpret the natural state of my body on that treadmill as a danger, as something that needed to be fleed from, escaped from, avoided, fought against, and I would go into fight or flight response. And once the adrenaline dump hits, we all know where it goes from there. So you see where we're able to unlink that, break that chain between the treadmill, the exercise, and the panic. It's not, here, here's the biggest point I'm going to make in this video before we go to part two. It is not the exercise that causes your panic, right? So if you are living your life right now in such a way that you're telling everybody that you can't exercise because exercise makes you panic, we need to stop that because it's not the exercise that makes you panic. The exercise only changes the state of your body. It's the incorrect interpretation of that state change that causes the panic. Because you fear the way your body feels, and you're always on guard for signs of panic because you feel you need to be rescued from it or avoid the fear, you're afraid of the fear, then your brain is incorrectly interpreting that natural state change as a danger, and there you go. Now you're into fight or flight mode, and now we have panic creeping in. So the incorrect interpretation of the state change, that cognitive distortion, 
a rapid heart rate, which an Olympic runner or a normal person on a treadmill doesn't give a second thought to. They expect it. For us, that rapid heart rate is a sign of danger, and it triggers all of that panic response. And then that, be, even though that's incorrect, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you may end up in a full-blown panic attack because you try to exercise. So this is the most important part of this video. It's not the exercise that makes you panic. The exercise only changes the state of your body. It's the way your brain interprets that state change that causes the panic. So even if you don't fully believe it right now, fake it. Pretend that you do because in order to solve this problem, you're going to have to ultimately believe that and buy into it. And I know that you can do it, but for now, at least fake it. Humor me on this. It's not the exercise that causes the panic. It's the brain part that causes the panic. And we can work on that. Now, why is this so important? You might be saying, yeah, but that's just semantics. It's intellectual. It's academic. It's bullshit or whatever. Excuse my French. But uh, you may be thinking of this as, nah, that's that's not anything. That's not going to help me at all, right? Uh, but that's not really true. And here's why. If you say that exercise makes you panic, then the natural solution to that problem is to not exercise. So if you say that exercise makes you panic, the natural solution that you will come up with is to not exercise. And we all know why that's bad. So now you're going to add that to the list of things you can't do and the problem never gets solved. If, however, you change that statement and you say, I am able to exercise, my body is perfectly able to exercise, it's just the cognitive stuff that makes me panic, well, now you have a different problem to solve. You don't have to never exercise again. Now we have to work on the cognitive part, that distortion, that incorrect interpretation. Now, I do not mean to imply that that's necessarily an easy thing to do, as you'll see in part two coming up. It is actually an easy plan. It's just hard to execute because of what it involves. But there's a big difference. So I want to end this with recapping again. It's not the exercise that causes panic. It's the cognitive distortion and the faulty interpretation that causes panic. So therefore, you must not say panic causes exercise. What you want to say is that you're fully capable and able to exercise, but you have some bad brain habits is the best way I could say it. And it happens to all of us, happened to me too. We have some brain, bad brain habits that we have to unlearn so that we can exercise comfortably, right? And, and effectively and productively. So I'm going to end it here. I would say come back for part two, where we're going to talk about the actual plan on how to solve this problem and where it can lead you after that. So I appreciate you stopping by. If you have comments, if you're watching on YouTube, by all means, comment in the comment section. Uh, if you're listening as a podcast, hit my website, thatanxietyguide.com. You can find my Facebook and my Twitter there. You can comment right there. Any way that you want to ask a question, make a comment, make a suggestion, whatever it is, yell at me because you hate me, whatever it is, I'm all good with it. Uh, just send it on by. I Again, I appreciate you taking the time. And for my friend Holly, Holly in the UK or wherever she is now, if you're listening, I'm going to end this the way I told you I was going to edit them all. And that is with this. And you guys are going to get this as we go. Stay present and prosper. <laughs>